most schools are doing some form of these intruder drills. But again, I'm voting for this bill because I want to make sure they all do. Because I want our babies and teachers to be as safe as they can. And I hope, I know the bill has an opt out that school boards can make a provision for parents to opt their children out. And I hope that no one does that. In the House, members debated a bill that would set up school safety training programs for educators. Good evening. Welcome to Lawmakers on Legislative Day 24. I'm Donna Lowry in Atlanta. On the show tonight, legislators join us to offer a closer look at some land issues in Georgia. We'll learn more about the privately owned Green Island and what the state is doing to try to acquire and preserve it. They'll also talk about legislation dealing with the Okefenokee Swamp and hear about an environmental bill aimed at the coal ash issue near Plant Shearer. The Georgia Power facility is located just north of Macon. Several bills are trying to help with victims' rights. Sponsors of a few of those bills join us later in the show. But first, let's get an update on the busy day at the Capitol. Today in the House, a particularly charged debate about House Bill 147 and safety plans for Georgia schools. Representative Will Wade carried the Safe Schools Act on behalf of Governor Kemp. This bill does four things. First, it establishes a voluntary school safety and anti-gang endorsement for current teachers or future teachers. It encourages colleges and universities within their teacher preparation programs to include training and best practices for promoting and preserving safe schools and identifying and deterring youth gangs. It also ensures that school safety plans that are currently submitted to their local law enforcement agencies be additionally shared with GEMA and Homeland Security. And last but not least, this will require an annual intruder alert drill before October 1st. And there is a provision that will allow for students and faculty to have an opt out. Democrats were divided about mandating intruder alert drills. Opponents noted the Safe Schools Act has a nice name, but is ultimately not good policy since it places the onus of safety on students and teachers. Some students, like Representative Jasmine Clark's daughter, say that these drills don't work. She said, Mom, these drills do not work because if the shooter is another student, they aren't stupid. They know the school is not empty. They know we're in there. And also, they've done these drills. They know the protocol. They know where we, they, where we are, and they are still going to kill us. Representative Ann Allen Westbrook said mandated intruder drills actually burden students and teachers. There is evidence, however, that intruder alert drills can have a significant negative impact on students' mental health. Our friends up the road at Georgia Tech conducted their own study of the immediate and long-term impacts of active shooter drills on the health and well-being of students, teachers, and parents. The results revealed a 42% increase in anxiety and a 39% increase in depression. We do not need to give teachers more to do and more reasons to leave the profession in this state. But Democrat Stacey Evans rose to support the bill, saying the reality is heartbreaking but necessary. If there is a school shooting and our children are able to, some of them, stay in a room and convince somebody that no one's in there, that's only going to work if everybody knows how to do it. Five-year-olds finding the deepest corner in their classroom or a little crevice behind where they hang their coats and backpacks up, getting down as close to the ground as they can and being absolutely silent. The teacher putting black construction paper over the window that are on most school classroom doors so that it looks like no one's there and then everybody being quiet. Five years old. Representative Lisa Hagan, a former classroom teacher, said the bill gives children a tool against those who will continue to disregard existing school safety zones. I remember when I was teaching uh, fourth grade in Lawrenceville when Columbine happened. The kids came to school the next day and they were scared. And we had to talk about this. We could not address it. And I agree with those of you that don't think we should have to. But I think it's, it's not um, in the best service of our children to not give them the tools and the preparation that they need should this happen. HB 147 passed 148 to 20. 
Most of the representatives with nay votes were women. And in the Senate, it might be a bit easier now for you to vote in the next election. SB 129 lets employers allow up to two hours for employees to vote in any local, state, or federal election, specifically for advanced in-person voting. That bill passed 51 to 4. Rural health care got a boost today as well. Senate Bill 99 would make the certificate of need requirement exempt on new rural hospitals that provide acute care as long as they treat a certain percentage of Medicare, Medicaid, and indigent patients. We have a need for innovation and access to expand into rural Georgia as it relates to health care, and this is a bill that will allow that to happen. CON is a regulatory mechanism that allows for controlling the volume of health care, and that is the exact opposite of what we need in rural Georgia. So we're going to allow new hospital construction in rural Georgia. But critics of the bill say that the certificate of need rules are there for a reason. What you're doing really is skirting regulations that are uh, uh, in place in Georgia to do this hospital that's very, very close to the hospital in the next county and that will adversely impact uh, the bottom line of the hospital in the next county. Uh, and, and creating a special carve out. Uh, isn't, that, isn't, that, isn't that the case? I mean, this is just really anti-regulatory uh, le legislation that you're trying to keep the state out of a decision to put up a hospital and run it. Uh, and, when it and when it no longer no longer meets the state definition of rural hospital, it still gets to call itself one and benefit from the state uh, uh, the, the, the law on, on rural hospitals, state regulations. Senator, I certainly would not classify us passing a law under the constitutional powers that we've been given and changing law as, quote, skirting regulation. What we do in this building is review and change things constantly. And I certainly would not characterize any of the changes to law that you put forward as skirting regulation, nor do I cl uh, classify this as, re as skirting regulation. That bill passed 42 to 13. And finally, if the sound of leaf blowers drives you crazy, you aren't going to like Senate Bill 145. That bill prohibits banning gas-powered leaf blowers versus electric leaf blowers because the technology is not equal as of yet. The law would sunset in 2031 to allow electric blower technology time to evolve. That bill passed 37 to 16. That's our Capitol Report. Now let's dig deeper into some individual bills dealing with land in Georgia. Joining me are Republican Representative Jesse Petrie of Savannah. He is chair of the House Human Relations and Aging Committee and Democratic Representative Mary Frances Williams of Marietta. Welcome to Lawmakers. It's Thank your you. first time. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So we're going to start with you, Chairman Petrie, your recent announcement about Green Island. And Green Island. I want people to hear more about it. Green Island is privately owned by the Lewis family. It's 450 acres, an island located in the southern end of Chatham County. And Chairman Petrie, before we get into the specifics of your announcement and what you have to tell us, describe it a little bit. You've been there. Oh, yeah. I've been on over, uh, all over all of the islands around uh, where I grew up. And uh, this is yet another beautiful island on the Georgia coast. You know, a lot of people don't realize how well we've protected the Georgia coast in, in this state. Um, we have, uh, without question, the most protected coast in the country. We have 12 barrier islands in this state, only four of which have any pre appreciable human population. Now, this island is not a barrier island, but it's, a, it's yet another island that we can preserve and protect. And as our state explodes with population growth, um, the time to do that, as I always say, is now, not 10 years from now. And so this, is, uh, this was a great opportunity to, uh, to take a, 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 a jewel, a, an island that is uh, just environmentally and histor historically uh, has so, so much value and try to preserve it forever. And so uh, I've acted as a liaison with the family, with the county, and with the state to try to find a way forward to save and protect this island forever. Uh, otherwise, it would eventually likely have been developed. And it involves this $3 million grant. Yes, ultimately, uh, to try to find a solution, uh, we needed to get the state to uh, 
Uh, I initially began by trying to get the state to purchase it, to, to add it to our Skidaway Island State Park. That didn't work out. And so we, um, we found a way by partnering with the county. And so we used GOSA funds. The Georgia Outdoor Stewardship Act is a, is a you know, a, a fund uh, that we've established. So when outdoor uh, sporting goods equipment is sold, a portion of those sales tax go to land preservation in this state. That was a bill we passed in about 2018, one of the best bills I've seen uh, come out of the legislature since I've been there. And it allows us some funds for this purpose. And so we're using those funds and our, our success was, and uh, so thankful to the governor and to the commissioner for supporting me on this, um, we, we, we've been able to get $3 million to dedicate to this purchase to help us to find a way to, uh, to make sure that we preserve this island. So at some point it'll be a park that people can go to, boating, what do, we, what do you our, expect our, people yeah, to use it for? We certainly expect public access. Uh, it would be ultimately owned by the county. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, uh, negotiations to take place between the family and the county, so I'm limited with what I can say there. Okay. But we clearly see a path forward to protect this island, and yes, it would be for uh, the public benefit. You know, if ever there's a time, we need young people, especially after this pandemic, we've learned how important it is that we have uh, a, a place for young people to be outside, to exercise, to enjoy being out outdoors, and this will just be another opportunity to do that in Chatham County. Okay, so not just young people, I'll just, not I'll everybody, just say that. Not everybody, but okay. especially young people. All right, right. <laughs> Representative Williams, I know one of your interests in terms of land is Okefenokee Swamp, and there there is a bill to to help with that in terms yes. of Georgians enjoying it. Yes, um, Chairman Darlene Taylor from Camilla has a bill, <laughs> House Bill 71, and it would outlaw mining in the Okefenokee Swamp, and right now uh, the EPD, Environmental Protection Division of is of Natural Resources is considering a giving a mining permit to this Twin Pines mining company, and um, it's it's just something that, in my opinion, should not be done. There's no place on earth like the Okefenokee, and I think we need to preserve it. It's it's one of the wonders of the world, and mining would would disturb the water table. There are a lot of hydrologists and other folks who have testified about it. Um, and Chairman Taylor has 51 signatures. It's very much supported by bipartisans. But to date, she has not been able to get a hearing in the Natural Resources and Environment Committee. Oh, well, that's interesting. You're a signer on that bill. Yeah, I was one of the you, top signers yeah. for Darlene. Does that surprise yeah, you, you haven't been able to get a hearing? Well, it's, it's very, you know, there, there's some real legitimate concerns people have because this is private property. Um, we believe, and I believe, um, as does Representative Williams, that, um, you know, there is such a unique location that we're talking about in this trail ridge geographically it's called the trail ridge and the hydrology of that site as it relates to the the adjacent position that it holds next to the part to the to the swamp uh, makes it rather unique and we believe therefore uh, this is a, a very appropriate measure and I'm very supportive but I do understand those that are uh, opposed I understand why but um, that's our challenge with getting it to a hearing. Well, 51 signers is a lot. We'll keep an eye it on that between now and crossover day. Representative uh, Williams, you, while you were on with environmental issues, you recently dropped a bill to deal with coal ash ponds, and, that, and this is a major issue for residents of the Juliet area, and which is Cobb. in Monroe County and Cobb County. Talk about what the bill is about. So House Bill 564, would um, would outlaw um, putting coal ash in storing it in areas where it is sitting in groundwater. And as a matter of fact, this is something that the EPA at the federal level has said cannot be done. Um, and as it turns out, uh, Georgia Power's plans for dealing with the coal ash are putting it into unlined pits uh, in standing in groundwater. So my bill would would um, just says that you you know you can't do it. It's illegal, which is what the federal government has said. Yeah, tell me about the area in in, in Cobb County. It's Plant McDonough, and it is sitting on the banks of the Chattahoochee, and there is six million tons of coal ash. It's being moved into uh, pits. It's it was in it was in ash ponds, and they were drained, and now it's being moved into pits. But they're not lining the pits. They have lined pits in some of the other sites in Georgia, but they are not willing to do it here. And I will just say, um, you know, 
this water is it belongs to the to the people and to you know it's not to be used as anybody's trash trash heap or whatever it's really it's the it's the source of our water our drinking water and we need to keep that safe and um, Georgia Power is using money that has been that is actually ratepayers' money to do this, you know, to to do what they're doing with the coal ash, which is not the right way to do it. And if we're going to use public money, I say let's do it the right way. Okay, I know that in Ohio they have uh, there's been a ruling with the EPA that says yes. they have to line those pits. So we'll we'll find out what happens in Georgia and keep up with what's going on Thank with you. your your bill. I want it real quick, we don't have a lot of time. You have HB 136 you wanted to talk about dealing yeah. with prisons and information regarding yeah. immigrants. Uh, so so 136 is a very simple measure. It's all about transparency and public safety and what it does is require the Department of Corrections to simply post on its public website the number of criminal illegals in the Georgia correctional system. That information is right now uh, impossible for constituents to get and to know. And indeed, I've had a hard time getting the exact number from the department. But what we do know is that today in Georgia prisons, there are about 1,525 ICE detainers that are violent or sexual offenders. So we have 175 murderers in this state, in the state correctional system, who are here illegally and then committed a murder on Georgia citizens. We have 230 child molesters in Georgia who are here illegally and then committed a child molestation on one or more of our citizens. And so we have a, we have a total of 1,525 of those individuals, ICE detainers alone. The total number exceeds ICE detainers because ICE does not put a detainer on all of our inmates. So I'm trying to get that information and make it uh, to where the public is aware of the degree to which uh, illegal immigration affects their public safety. And this is that's the main part part of your bill is to try to get that information. That's and, what you want to begin with. And to with. make it transparent to the public every quarter on the on the Department of Corrections website. Okay. Yes, Keep ma an eye on that too. Thank you both for being Thank here. You. I Thank appreciate you. it. Coming up, we'll talk about victims' rights legislation when it comes to workplace harassment and sexual assault kits. Lawmakers is made possible by Georgia Farm Bureau. With over 80 years of helping everyone understand the importance of agriculture in our state. After all, ag is Georgia's number one industry. Food and fiber production represents over 74 billion in output of Georgia's strong economy. The Georgia Farm Bureau legislative team works to represent producers across Georgia at the state capitol during the session and year round. Georgia Farm Bureau, the voice of Georgia farmers. Here's what's new this month with Passport. Kirsten had a lot of courage. She fought for black culture. They could have killed you. You're exactly what we need right now. Oh my God. What is this? She was poisoned. These and all your favorite shows are available with Passport. Support your PBS station and stream more with Passport on the PBS app. We care about things that affect the lives of every American. We are there at the front line to get to the heart of what really matters in every issue. This country has not seen this in 80 years. This extraordinary moment in American history. You're making such a huge impact. Trust is at the heart of what we do. One of the easiest ways to support GPB is to become a monthly GPB sustainer. Your monthly support continues automatically month after month and supports not only the great programming that you love on GPB, but also our efforts in the community. GPB is committed to provide a trusted space for lifelong learning on the air, digitally and in person all across Georgia. All this is made possible with your monthly support. And we can't do it without you, so please donate right now at gpb.org give. And thanks. Welcome back to Lawmakers. I'm Donna Lowry. We're going to focus on some bipartisan bills with people who are very much in favor of them. They're dealing with victims' rights. And joining us are Democratic Representative Scott Holcomb of Atlanta and Democratic Representative Terry Anulowitz of Smyrna. Welcome to Lawmakers. 
Thank you. Okay, so your bipartisan bill, Representative Anulowitz, it would offer protections for workplace harassment. And so tell us more about it. That's right. So this bill, it's HB 381, and what it offers is protections for workers. We have federal protection through Title VII of the EEOC. The issue we've realized in Georgia through talking through people who have been through this kind of harassment, through the attorneys who've tried to help people make these cases, more than 95% of these cases don't, they're not ever heard in the federal court system. It's really, really difficult for victims of workplace harassment to receive the, the hearing, the fair, the fair hearing, the fair trial. And so I thought, well, we can do a better job than the federal government here in Georgia. We can, we can have these protections. We can have legislation that mirrors these EEOC protections, but also makes them even better, does more for Georgians, makes, makes these things easier for Georgia workers if they are receiving harassment, and also um, make it easier for employers to know exactly what they need to do to have the affirmative defense if they're accused of harassment. Yeah, and so I know you have had, you've had this bill for a while. Yeah. Have, you, have you changed it at all, or do you, are you feeling more confident? What's so this bill's been in the work for, for several years. We have been working on this bill with advocates, with the representatives from the business community. I actually picked this, le this legislation up from Representative B. Wynn yeah. when she left the General Assembly, was focusing on her statewide campaign. She asked me if I would take this on, which I gladly did. So, I mean, again, for multiple years, there have been a lot of conversations, bipartisan conversations yeah. happening. We had a three-hour hearing last year in the House Judiciary Committee uh, discussing the bill. So I think everyone, it's everyone on the Judiciary Committee who was, was on the committee last year is very familiar with with what this bill does. Okay, I, I want to talk to you about this, Representative Holcomb, because you're one of the several attorneys who signed on to this. So it includes representatives uh, Rob Leverett, uh, Tyler Paul Smith, Mary Margaret Oliver, all attorneys, you favor this. Tell me why. Um, it's needed for the reasons that Representative Anulowitz said, is Georgia has been a laggard in these areas, and it will provide another uh, provision within our state law to protect uh, in, against discrimination. So. Yeah, and, and right now, you, how are you feeling about the bill being able to make it? I like its chances. I, I, I think often they are a multi-year effort, and it moved last year, um, and it should move again this year. And I think what we're going to see for a lot of bills is a, a lot of urgency over the next few days, and then a wave of bills on crossover day next yeah. Monday. And people who have experienced harassment, they just they just want some relief and, and right. to be heard and to go through a process. That's right, and it's important to make it clear, you know, what the rights are for workers, but also what we're asking of businesses, because we wanted to have a very clear affirmative defense for business owners in, in Georgia. So, so they know exactly what they need to do. And again, it's, it's very clear, it mirrors federal language, and I think it's something that, you know, sh would hopefully be welcomed. I know, I think most businesses in Georgia are doing the right thing, but we know that not everyone is, and we know that there are a lot of workers who have faced some pretty, some pretty unfortunate consequences. And frankly, we know how tight the labor market is in Georgia right now. Yeah. We know employers are very focused on workforce and workforce retention, and I think that when workers know that they do have protections in place, that Georgia, we are, we are looking out for their best interests, I think that will help with workforce retention. Yeah, and, and bringing people into Absolutely. the workforce. Yeah. Absolutely. So Representative Holcomb, let's change a little bit. You have a bill, HB 365, the Sexual Assault Reform Act. Tell us a little bit about that. This effort builds upon uh, about six, seven years worth of work. Uh, the state, in a very bipartisan way, has worked to address the backlog of untested sexual assault kits. We've worked to preserve the evidence, and we've instituted a tracking system. Um, when we're not in session, I work year-round with those that work to help survivors of sexual assault. So before the session started, I asked them, what are things that we need to do to continue to improve our state's laws? And they gave me a number of, of ideas. One of them is to expand the footprint of sexual assault nurse examiners. These are nurses with specific skills that can help those who have been the victim of rape or sexual assault. So they help with uh, preserving the evidence and to make sure that we can then take the evidence and use it to prosecute uh, the offenders. Um, in addition, there is a provision to ban do-it-yourself kits. 
Uh, this is a new idea, and I think as a former prosecutor is a horrible idea, because if an individual were to um, use a do-it-yourself kit, that has tremendous problems for chain of custody, and it would not be admissible in court. So what we want the victims to do is to go to a care provider, to go to a sexual assault center, to go to an emergency room and have a trained person, a sexual assault nurse examiner, take the evidence that knows what that person is doing and then can protect the evidence uh, going forward. So I had not heard of these kits. Yes. So something on the market that somebody's trying to sell and people think, well, I don't have to tell the police. I can just do this myself. Exactly. And, and that's the, the idea behind it. And without really knowing um, the consequences of that, let alone the state of Georgia has made a policy that no victim pays for a sexual assault kit. The taxpayers pay for that. So if an individual presents to have um, care provided after a sexual assault, that is not on them in terms of the financial burden. So th th this is a market that is attempted to be developed and advocates for them, it was their number one priority. And so I listen to them, I do what uh, they suggest and recommend, and that's why I'm advocating for this. Have we seen the numbers? I know a few years ago, as you mentioned, in Georgia, we had uh, just this huge backlog of sexual assault kits. Are we better? We are better, however, um, there are still issues with processing in a timely manner, and that gets to resource allocation to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. I think they do a tremendous job with the resources that they're given, but we have to make sure that we continue to give those resources so that way the kits are, are tested and tested timely. But the old backlog has been cleared. So yeah. I am grateful for that. And I know you're a sponsor on this bill, yes. too. Yes. Yeah. Lots of interest in it. I'm an, I am an enthusiastic supporter. Representative Holcomb has really been the leader in the General Assembly for many years on making sure that we, the state of Georgia is doing everything we should be doing to make sure that all of these rape kits are tested, to make sure that survivors of rape have the resources they need. And this bill is, is one, and you know, there's this chain of legislation that we've had to support survivors of rape and sexual assault and to make sure that these crimes are prosecuted to make sure that these victims and these survivors receive the support they need and this is another piece of that puzzle. Yeah, I'm glad you're telling us about it because I think people think, oh, a, a kit, at least, the, uh, you know, it's, it, their embarrassment is right. not there, right. those kinds of things. So the kind of things right. you're doing as do-it-yourself kit, it, I guess they thought it was, it sounds like a good idea, but I'm sure somebody's trying to make money on it. Um, I did want to ask you quickly about HB 382. It's companion to your other bill, right? Uh, different. I, I just okay. have to drop them one after another. All right. Tell, <laughs> tell us about that Yes, briefly. HB 382 is actually going to be heard in the House Judiciary Committee tomorrow before the full committee. This is a victim-centered program for restorative justice. And what this does is it's similar to what happens in a lot of other states. Uh, it, is, it is something that helps provide healing for for victims for and their survivors, it it offers accountability. Um, it is important to bring together, you know, th these these victims and the it's 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 brings it considers the the needs of the survivors and having this conversation. It's opt in, so this is only something that a survivor or a victim does if it's something they choose to do. It's led by a trained facilitator. It's very specific who can who can lead these conversations between the victim and the person who, who committed that wrongdoing against them. And it's, again, it's done in Texas, it's done in many states, and it's something that I hope we're able to offer survivors here in Georgia. It's supported by the many organizations, including Street Grace, which deals with human trafficking survivors, the Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and so I'm excited for this hearing tomorrow. Yeah, so this is these are people who want to actually talk to right. the people who have committed the crimes against them? Right, because that is something that has been found to be a very important it's very important to the healing process for, for victims and survivors who choose to do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Briefly, you are supporting this bill, too. Yes. I love that this is, uh, <laughs> we have you both on today. No controversy. But you, yeah, there, this is something you feel that's needed as an attorney. I do. Yeah, I, I think it will be helpful in, in the aspect of um, having the victims have their voices listened to is, is extraordinarily important in terms mm -hmm. of recovery, yes. Okay. Well, uh, we're going to keep up with all of these bills and let people know. And good luck. Crossover day Monday. Yes. So good luck to you on all of that. Thank, Thank you so much you. for coming you. on the show. That does it for Lawmakers today. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow for day 25 of the Georgia Legislative Session. To keep up with the world of politics, tune in to Political Rewind with Bill Nygut weekdays at 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. Good night.